I say when you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. And in Dungeons and Dragons, that is literally true with psionics. I've told you about my uh, ill-fated character, Smilin' Jack, who was very tragically cut down in the very first round of combat in his very first fight at the very beginning of his career. But believe it or not, I have had a character not even last that long. In fact, his career lasted negative seconds before it even began. And to understand how, I have to dive into the very deep rabbit hole of the mind that is psionics, with a P. What is psionics? It's a very complicated question with a multitude of answers. The most succinct version being psionics was terrible. Um, the slightly more helpful version is that psionics is a kind of magic. Uh, there's really nothing like psionics uh, anymore in fantasy RPGs, uh, at least none that I can think of. Mainly because it was it was so strange, it was out of place. Um, uh, but to back up a little bit, um, there's really two kinds of magic in in most in in D and D anyway. There's divine magic, which is the magic granted by the gods. You know, you, you pray to a god, you you pray to Zeus, and he enables you to you know smite thine enemies with a bolt of lightning. And then there's arcane magic, which is a a vague a vague force that you don't really have to explain, but, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a potent energy field that surrounds us and binds the galaxy together. Uh, that allows you to basically with the power of will and, you know, arcane formulae and, and alchemy, you know, just stuff that's everything else. That's, that's arcane magic, you know, uh, you know, blood magic and sin. Okay. But the, uh, then there's psionics, which in brief is the power of, Harnessing the magic power of the mind, um, which always seemed really strange to me. Um, and, and in fact, not, it, again, out of place in the sense that, you know, using the power of the mind can somehow rival or surpass that granted by Zeus. Um, but it did in D&D. &D. Uh, I, I think every group who played a D&D &D or before that attempted to use psionics and were very quickly horrified, confused, and disappointed by the experience, and, and really regretted it afterwards, uh, rather like eating at Chipotle. Um, it, it's, it's one of those things where, like I said, it was, it was really complex and confusing, and you just wondered why they, why they bothered doing it, because um, it, it, it just played by its own set of rules that had never been done before, and it was just you were just baffled by the implementation of it. It was like playing Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core. I mean, a slot machine, really? That's how we're going to decide most of our, our combats. Is we're going to have we're going to have a character run around, but there's just going to be a slot machine up in the corner that that determines when you level up. I mean, seriously, that happens. There was a anyway. That's a whole other can of worms. Um, so. Uh, to be more helpful in describing what psionics is or does, uh, it's kind of all over the place. Um, psionics is a little like telepathy. You know, the power to read and influence minds like Professor X of the X-Men or to float things with, you know, your mind, like, again, the X-Men or, or like Jedi um, or that the, the, the bullshit that the sectoids would screw you over with on a regular basis in XCOM. I mean, come on, I need line of sight, but these fuckers don't get screwed. Um, uh, Scanners, if you ever saw Scanners, great movie. Um, essentially, but, but yeah, to, to sum up again, psionics is basically the power to melt brains and make heads explode. Um, the final answer to that question um, is that Psionics was a supplementary book that uh, most people think of this book when they think of Psionics. It's, a, it's one of the splat books that, that adds this magic to your world, and it takes this entire book to define you know, the, the rules for it, and the rest of it is, is spells. And it introduces the class called the Psionicist. But it actually goes back further than that. It, it actually is another set of optional rules that I, I think at least I'd forgotten that it was even here, but it's a set of it's it's a it's a brief little chapter in the back that again your eyes just kind of glaze over when you look at it. I'll, I'll show you some of the rules here, but um, when you look at it, first off, it deter you have to you have to 
there's just these mathematical formulae all over the place to you you have to first qualify for it by having an absurdly high intelligence wisdom or charisma and then there's determining whether or not you are psionic which the odds of this are ludicrous um it's you know one percent for each point of intelligence over 16 add two and a half to the die roll one for each point of wisdom over 16 and then one for every just already you're, you're just like oh you have to calculate your percentage, then you have to roll the percentage, um, which is basically determined by the you know the intangible qualities of your character. But that's not that's that's not even. Then you have to determine how potent your psionic ability is. So even if you qualify, you may really be weak, which you know in a in a in a plot sense makes sense. But balance <laughs> out the window. I mean so far out the window because if you get one really powerful you are akin to a god at at first level you know you, you just have these limitless resources and again the power to fucking explode brains whereas another character who you know who rolls a one might be able to 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 lift a coin or or determine how many fingers you got behind your back you know or whatever but there goes my dragon I'm sorry, dragon. Um, so the first thing that it actually properly prioritizes what your first questions are um, when it comes to psionics is how do I make heads explode? Okay. Well, it goes to it goes to you know determining your psionic powers, and then it goes right into um, how you do that. Um, there's basically five powers that are used for attack modes. Um, and then there's, uh, yeah, five defense modes that are complementary to the attack modes. It's basically like a really complicated rock, paper, scissors, where you're almost, when you start, you have to choose a number, you have to choose a subset of those five. So like, you know, say you choose three of them. So if you choose poorly and the person has the one that you can't counter, well, then you're screwed. So right away, it's irritating. So, when you look at the attack modes, see if you can find out, see if you can figure out, on your own, what does what. There's Psionic Blast, Mind Thrust, Ego Whip, Id Insinuation, and Psychic Crush. Well, those sound really cool and strange, like Ego Whip, and it's exactly what it sounds like. Ego Whip attacks the ego, either by feelings of inferiority or worthlessness, or by superiority and megalomania. The attack affects but a single creature. So it, it literally is a psychic attack that makes you feel like crap. It's like, it's like going on Reddit, only much more, you know, it doesn't take as long. Um, and it actually, it, it reminds me of in 4th edition, there's a bard ability... Uh, called Vicious Mockery, wherein you can kill people with a Yo Mama joke. But, you know, I, I had a character, Skitch, who he, he got so many kills with Vicious Mockery, that was basically his go-to power, was he was just insulting people like Don Rickles. Like, you know, your mama's so fat, her blood type is ragu. And then there's the, the defensive powers, which, again, see if you can figure out what cancels what. There's Mind Blank, Thought Shield... Mental Barrier, Intellect Fortress, and Tower of Iron Will, and then uh, think about baseball. You know, some of these affect only you, some of these affect an area of effect, because here's the other thing. Chances are excellent that nobody else in the group will be psionic, which means it having psionics opens a door in your campaigns, and it's, it's a door that even DMs don't want to step through, like... You know how I always said that, you know, when you get on a boat, it opens certain doors. Like, you know, we just can't wait to crack out the the Kraken or the giant octopus and things like that. We're really eager to do that because it's awesome. But then there's psionics. There, there's a number of psionic creatures that you can introduce. You know, um, uh, intellect devourers, illithids, you know, mind flayers and stuff like that, which do exist before with without psionics. You know, they have magic powers. But when you introduce psionics, oh, then they've got all these powers, and then you have to you have to study up on this second set of rules that really only one person uses. 
but everyone is affected by it. And exactly what you're thinking, if you don't know psionics, you know, if, if, you, if you don't have the power, you're essentially helpless before their, their mental attacks, because you have no defenses. You, you have like a rudimentary, basically just the untrained power of your will, which, yeah, that's not happening, especially against anyone with any remote style of power. Trying to describe what these do, okay, ego whip. What? Does that cause damage? You know, why is it insinuation more powerful than the others? Um, it, yes, it does damage, but that's that's not the only thing. What what is it? What do they do? You don't know. It describes kind of what it does. It whips your ego, but what does that mean in 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 the game? It doesn't tell you. It it does not tell you in the book. It it actually uh, it refers you to. Um, uh, it's it says somewhere like um refer to the refer to the matrixes you know matrices in the dungeon master guide to figure out what these things that you have do what the hell is that how am i supposed to choose when i don't know if they're any good how why do you keep it a secret what the combat rules are there's all these secret matrices i'm not even shitting you there's you you have to go in here and you have to go digging for for matrices. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. I've I've never seen this before. And th this is just a fraction. That all look at it, your eyes just blur over here. And the reason they do that is because psionics applies differently to whatever target you're hitting. So there's there's um psionics for oh I'm sorry I showed you the wrong matrices these are there's only there's only two or three matrices but they're they're much bigger and they're much more complex because they involve like percentage chances and they have to you know they have to describe every power interacting with every other power so there's there's like an exponential or geometric growth of of the size of this table and so. In essence, there's two matrices. Um, I, actually, I think there's three, four. Yeah, four. So there's the there, there's the there's the relationship between attack and defense modes. You know, damage and um, and what kind of damage is done for psionics fighting each other. You know, when when the other person has psionics. And then there's the other table for what happens when a psionic guy picks on somebody who doesn't have psionics. If it was two scanners, man, your psionicist would look fucked. You know, he'd, he'd be all, like, half melted and, and, like, you know, veins, blood vessels bursting in his head. I don't think about it. It actually is kind of awesome. Although, I, I'd expect the psionicist to roleplay it. You know, like, gradually, like, smear blood on his face and stuff like that. Anyway. So... What what interested me most about this is how unfair this is towards non psionicists in 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 old style D and D. Um, you know, old D and D was not really all about the fairness or even balance, but psionicists were on a different playing field. I'm going to get to that, but um, so you've got uh, basically you're defending with. Um, oh, I'm sorry. There's another table. Okay, there's what happens. When psionicists attack each other in mental combat, and then there's what happens when a psionicist attacks another psionicist who is defenseless because they still have unconscious barriers, but it's a much different style of combat. So, of course, we have another giant matrix. And so there's not only numbers, there's 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 results. Um like conditions and results that occur um, from things like psionic blast and psychic crush. I'm sorry, no, I, man, I'm lying to you. It's a psionic blast is the one that's meant to burn you out. Psychic crush, what does that do? It should say. It just has a percentage. That's all it says. I don't know. That's, this, this is terrible. Okay. Oh, I, okay. Psychic Crush shows the percentage chance of instantly killing the opponent. 
Any score above that shown for the defensive used for the defensive mode used indicates no effect. A dash indicates no possible chance of causing instant death. Okay, so it it's it's gonna not gonna be very effective um, if you're not very powerful. But if you're a powerful psionicist, which isn't even really that hard, if you've got psionics, man, all you got to do is roll a high you know a high psionic strength number. And when you look at the table, your chances are like, if if they choose the wrong defensive mode, are like 20%. This doesn't take into account level or anything. You dead. Head exploded. Gone. And if the, if the psionicist is defenseless, somebody can just sneak up on you in your sleep and then, yeah, 90% chance of just dying outright. That sucks. And that's assuming that it is a psionicist that he's attacking. If you're not, oh, God, I don't, I don't even think there's a matrix for that. It's just, nah, yeah, right, no, dead. Um, psionic blast is the one that causes these weird conditions. Um, uh, like, okay, so it, it, there's all these letters like C, D, I, K, P, S, okay. They define those below the matrix. So C is confused for two to eight rounds. No psionics possible. Um, confused being an actual like magic state. So now you have to look at the spell confusion. Great. Um, dazed for one to four turns. Idiocy. The I is for idiocy. Psionic ability lost forever. Although idiocy is curable by a heal spell. If only it were that simple in real life. Maybe there'd be hope for Donald Trump. Um, or they permanently, you permanently burn out part of your psionic abilities. K is killed. You can be resurrected, but your psionics are burned out. Sleeping robot. You don't turn into a robot, at least not literally. It means you're under control of the victor until released or two to eight weeks have elapsed. And you make a saving throw. Against magic, again, ironically, instead of making a save against... I can't believe... I cannot believe they didn't introduce a save versus psionics. No, a save versus magic. Is robot really the only term you could think of? Like, oh, you've become a robot. And, the, the, and again, the player character does not have this. Does it, You're just... The DM is just rolling shit. You know, what do you do? Uh, I psychic crush the guy. Th they don't know the psychic... What does it say for psychic crush? It's a massive assault upon all neurons in the brain, attempting to destroy all by a massive overload of signals. This mode of attack affects but one defender. The If it is used, the defender may only defend with one thought mode G or have no defense at all. So if you didn't choose that and you get psychic crushed, goodbye. Man, it's a dangerous game playing with the brain. So that's probably what it means, but uh, that's probably another definition of defenseless. If you don't have the defense, or you you know either either you are not conscious enough to raise a defense, or you don't have it, wow. If you look at this table, holy shit. Even the weakest one, uh, even a weak psionic with a one point in it, or you know, the minimum number to cast it, Against even a moderately strong psionicist, 50-50. Outright death. Holy crap. Right? Um, <laughs> robot. How do you be... What, what, what's... I don't even see uh, the result of robot. How do you become a robot? Oh, it insinuation can turn you into a robot. Why don't they just say zombie? Well, would that be confusing? Like you know, you become a zombie under the control of the of the psionicist. Would why, why don't you do? Oh, I'm sorry. I would have gone with D for dominated, or C for charmed. But those letters are taken. Yeah, I guess robot was the only way out. Uh, although wounded psionically, this is all over the map. And then my favorite part is. Um, what happens when a non-psionicist is attacked. Um, and you would think that having really, really high 
intelligence, wisdom, and charisma would better insulate you from the more dangerous effects of being psychic blasted and whatnot. Oh no, that's not the case at all. In fact, if you're stupid, you're 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 more insulated. Because I I don't know you're you're harder to. There's nothing there to 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 mentally twist or something like that. You know, you can't do any damage to my brain. I don't have one. Where's the... Yeah, okay. So there's another matrix for the attacked creature's total intelligence and wisdom. I, I just... I killed my own case here. Well, if it's... If, you're, if your combined intelligence and wisdom is 0 to 5, yeah, death is almost certain. But beyond that, if it's from 6 to 9 or 10 to 13... You're much more likely to put, be put in a coma, uh, knocked to sleep, stunned, or confused. Now, that's not fun. It's not good at all. But then, the, the more intelligent and wise you get, then we start getting into the fun categories. Confused, enraged. Having, a, having an enraged spellcaster, that'd be fun, too. Then we go to feeble mind, which... A feeble mind lasts until heal, restoration, or wish is used. Oh, so nothing expensive then. Then there's temporary insanity, and by temporary, I mean 2 to 12 weeks. And then there's mild insanity, 1 to 4 weeks. Only one form of insanity. Um, permanent insanity. There's like three kinds of insanities. Jesus. Oh, I'm sorry. And there's modifiers. So there's, if you're a magic user, you get plus one. If you're, to your saving throw, that is. Elves get plus two. If you're a dwarf, plus four. Halflings, plus, halflings? If you're s panicked, enraged, hopeless, hopeless? The fuck does that mean? If you're hopeless, there is nothing here that defines the word hopeless. Except maybe Smiling Jack. He was hopeless. Eh. You got me on that one, man. Maybe there's a spell? That I, I, stunned. They, they don't define these at all. Feeble-minded, insane. Eh. Insane creatures cannot be psionically attacked. They're just... You can't... You can't... You can't lock in. You know, you can't, there's nothing to, there's nothing to focus on. It's just a, a tangled, it's a Gordian knot of psycho. Um, so anyway, the more intelligent and wise you get, you become permanently crazy. The, so it, when you're really weak, you just get knocked out. When you're really smart, you go crazy. And almost certainly forever. So, like, if 26 to 29, that's assuming, like, a 13 in both those scores, you are almost certainly going to be feeble-minded. Forever. Seriously. 91 to 99, unless you get a heal, restoration, or wish. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if it's... If, if your combined score is 30 to 33, which is a lot, but... Yeah, permanent feeble mind. That's nuts. If they're really, really smart, 34 to 35, permanent insanity is almost certain. This is crazy. <laughs> and what I was what I was going back to there uh, was, okay, so when you look at the list of powers, psionic blast, mind thrust, ego whip, uh, the defense modes, tower of iron will, uh, uh, Hang on, what was it? Uh, mind blank, thought shield, mental... What do those mean? Like, it can tell me. It insinuation seeks to loose the uncontrolled subconscious mind of the defender, pitting it against the superego. Okay. What? How do... Am I supposed to describe that to the players? Like, your, your id is going crazy? Or do I just give them a number? You know... Let me put it this way. Any other kind of magic, divine, arcane, when you look at the spells, 
you know what they do. It's obvious. The, the name of the spell is pretty much the description of what it is. It's easy to infer what happens when you cast Fireball. I, I don't need to read the definition. I mean, you have to read the spell, of course, but I, I, I look at Fireball. I have a fair idea what that means, what it does, and it's going to hurt in, with fire in the shape of a ball. And that's not good. You know, <laughs> whereas id insinuation, ego whip, is that, that sounds like it sucks, but will that kill me? I don't know. Is that better or worse than psychic crush? Because that sounds fucking horrible. It is. But maybe it sucks. Maybe id insinuation, it, like, you know, uh, uh, call lightning. Wish, uh, heal, restoration, those are all kind of generic terms, but you have a fair idea what it does. I don't know. Anyway, th this was friggin' hilarious. Uh, then we get to AD&D, where they didn't learn their lesson, and then they introduced this uh, entirely separate set of rules. It, it's kind of like... The gloves come off. And the DM doesn't want the gloves to come off here because now I have to introduce... I have to introduce psionic shit to oppose them. Which, if you're not psionic, that's bad news. So, like, I have to go after the players. The Mind Flayer has to go flay minds. That's what they do. They're bad enough without, like, the psionics in the, in the traditional rules. But... There, there's another table here and in here where the monster manual with all the monsters in it does not outline what uh, what the, the, the what any of the monsters intelligence or wisdom is because you never need to know that you know what's the orcs combined into? I, I don't know it's it's it varies you know if you're trying to if you're trying to mind crush a dire bear. What's its combined intelligence and wisdom? I, I don't know. So you have to calculate it every time you get a monster. Now you're taking notes as the DM. Now the game gets slow. And besides that, since there's only one person doing it, you have to keep you have to keep flipping back and forth through the DM guide. You know, it we had this system that was completely streamlined, fast as hell. Um, and now we've replaced it with something that's that's really, really oddly slow and boring, and you just want it to end. And you know, when it's over, you just you just feel bad, and you, we just we're we're not going to do psionics. We're not. We're just going to shuffle this off to the side, and we're not going to talk about it anymore. It's like the fifth season of Babylon Five. You know, which strangely enough also involves psionics. Interesting through interesting line going through this discussion here, um, but yeah. So we have to now we're rewriting the monster manual. This is just getting radically out of hand. Um, so they also define the psionicist class. So you've got another class with their own little with their own powers, their own, um, their own special abilities, their own saving throws. Um, so by what do I mean by their proficiencies, gem cutting, harness subconscious, hypnosis, rejuvenation, meditative focus, musical instrument. I guess when you're hypnotizing people, you can like play that flute that you charm the cobras with. Like I said, the rest of this is the the list of powers. And this is actually really interesting because they they actually do start to outline much cooler powers. So oh god, and that choosing those is a joy because it's not just like you you don't just say like oh well 
you know, just pick two or three of these at first level. No, you have to have these things called uh, uh, disciplines. What, what do you what do you do? Hang on. You got to flip back and forth. So your attack and defense modes are separate. Okay, they still do that thing with the with the mind blank thought shield. So that's still there. And to to even start doing that, you have to do what's what's called a, a a mental link or something like that. So to even start mind blasting someone, you have to like it's almost like a modem connection, you know, on dial up. You you first have to like lock missiles, lock, lock your mind bullets on, and unless that happens, you can't do anything. So you're first trying to seek out the target, you know, because he's right in front of you, but you can't pin him down. And then once you do that, and then the thing is. This actually, it actually gets worse here in a way because um, psionic combat occurs at the speed of thought. It occurs. How how much in the movie Inception is the dream world faster, or at least you know, like time is dilated. In in this, psionic combat takes place ten times as fast as combat in the real world, or at least, you know, the world outside of their brains. So when psionics, psionicists fight, everyone goes around, then it's the psionicist's turn, and they have 10 rounds of combat just trying to melt each other's brains. 10! I, I, the memories of this are coming back, and it was horrible. So, when they make their character and they choose friggin' hypnosis, which is not as cool as you'd think, they they actually go, they, they kind of go real world on this one, where psionics are just kind of like, it, it takes hours and it puts you in a s suggestion, it's not like this thing where you... You just look at them and go crazy-eyed and, and, and do this and you make them dance, like in combat. No, it's just like, I'm gonna help you remember things. Which is useful, I guess, but it's when you think hypnosis, you st again start thinking X Men. No, it's nothing like that. Oh, psychic lock. Yes, that's what what happens when you first have to to mind wrestle people. Um, if both characters main in the new psychic contest, if you cannot maintain your power, effectively giving up, you suffer a backlash and suffer four d four. PSPs immediately. In which case, in any case, victory may be fleeting. If conditions are right, the loser can challenge the winner to a rematch in the next round. Jesus Christ. Tangents. Each time an attack mode overcomes a defense mode, or an attack mode succeeds against someone who is not using a defense mode, the attacker has established a partial contact called a tangent. Three tangents equal full contact. Thus, establishing contact with someone, someone's mind through combat requires three successful attacks. In common parlance, a tangent is often called one-finger contact, and two tangents, two-finger contact. We're getting into a weird pervy area here. The last time I two-finger contacted someone, it was April, and we agreed we shouldn't do that anymore. You know... Well, that's yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Uh, in other words, three successive attacks take the place of one successful use of contact. Well, the tangents no longer apply when contact is established. That's why there's no such thing as three finger contact. Oh, so we're not we're not doing the spocker. <laughs> there's there's no three finger contact, guys. There's no such thing. I don't want to hear it. It's unnatural. Okay? Don't you even show me nothing about three-finger contact. Because that shit, that ain't happening. Okay? Once you've established your tangents, then it's two-finger contact, and then it's... We're past third base. There is no third base. We Once you're at second, they're waving... They're, they're waving you around once you get past second. Just go for it, man. Balls deep. And once you're fully con con uh, contacted, once you've gone three fingers, um, then the the character is essentially uh, helpless before you. 
So yeah, there's there's all sorts of like schools of thought that define what powers you can choose. So clairsentience. Let's see, psychokinesis. Essentially, I guess the power to oh psychokin psychokinesis, psychokinetics. Ugh. Psychometabolic. Psychometabolic. Sorry, metabolic. <clears throat> so again, let's see if you can figure out what these spells or psionic disciplines do. Body control. Body equilibrium. Cell adjustment. Double pain. Chemical stimulation. Sounds like fun. With this devotion to sciences, Sionysus can make his body simulate the action of acids. The character secretes an acid through his hand. Any item he touches and holds briefly must make a saving throw versus acid or be dissolved. Acid for blood. Immovability. Nothing moves the blob. I don't see how that's really useful. You get, what are you going to do? Prop him in front of a door? Think real hard, Joe. Just, just be immovable. You'd be great in tug of war, I guess. Lend health. Share strength. Probability travel. It's like a hitchhiker's guide. You can use the infinite improbability drive. When a wizard uses the astral spell, he forms an astral body, which remains connected. Oh, Jesus. Banishment, teleport, summon planar creature, teleport, other dimensional door, dimension walk, dream travel. Okay, anyway, my point is, I don't have a point. <laughs> the, 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 there's a lot of cool powers here. So it's not all just spending 10 rounds staring at each other intently and, and d doing boring combat. They do introduce a number of kind of cool powers, but the problem... Well, actually, I'll get to the problem in a second. So, th th there's awesome powers, and they sound great. So, there's Psychic Crush, like in Yu-Gi-Oh! You know, you can mind crush people. Um, there's Ultra Blast. I don't know what the fuck that is. Let's see if we can find Ultra Blast. I didn't write down the page number. Figures, right? I, I, I took extensive notes, but I didn't put down Ultra Blast. Mind Wipe. Ejection? It's, like, it's the final defense against unwanted contact. Yeah, once somebody's going for three fingers, you better eject them. Ho! May never unsee that. Probe. This is getting into a really, really uncomfortable area here. Aw. A-W-E. Conceal thoughts. Otherwise known as pop, 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 poke, play, pop, pop, pop. Daydream? By using this power, the telepath causes someone's mind to wander. Really? This is only effective against creatures with intelligence 14 or less who are not concentrating hard before... They're not concentrating hard on the task before them, so aren't they already daydreaming? Once affected, the daydream pays little attention to his surroundings, making it much easier for someone to pick his pocket, slip past him on it. Why would you choose this? Of all the shit you could choose, that one. Empathy. You can sense the basic needs, drives, and or emotions generated by any... You know, I always find that funny. In uh, Star Trek, The Next Generation, why they had Counselor Troy on the bridge, right? And they make this big deal about how she's an empath. She can sense emotions. So, like, uh, for instance, you know, Klingons decloak off the starboard bow and launch disruptors, you know, and, you know, fuck up the Enterprise. And then, you know, they're like, uh, the Klingons are hailing us. And the Klingon gets on screen and gets real close. You know, Like, and Counselor Troy, very helpfully, saunters up to Picard and goes, I sense he's very angry, Captain. Fucking thanks, Diana. It's... 
Empathy. Identity penetration. Wait, wait, wait. Incarnation awareness? By applying this power to another character, the scientist can gain knowledge about past lives. One past life can be explored per round. Past lives? And those immediately... Ha wow, this is establishing a weird... Uh, this establishes all new rules for how death is handled in Dungeons & Dragons, right? There's no such thing as reincarnation, except there's like a spell that does reincarnation, but this makes it official. Usually when you die in D&D, &D, you go to the, you know, the afterlife, the, you know, the outer planes to, to, you know. No, you get reincarnated. And a scientist can look at your past lives through your genetic memory. That's weird. Invincible foes. The victim of this devotion believes that any blow struck against him will cripple or kill him. Couldn't that be any blow? Like, in if this were real? Like, I don't care how many hit points you have, any blow could cripple or kill you. Even if the blow actually causes just one point of damage, the victim thinks he's dying and that he can no longer fight. Well, I have that all the time. I broke my toe once and I was just done for months. <sighs> mind bar, mind thrust, phobia amplification. Where's ultra? Repugnance. Synaptic static. Thought shield truth ear. You can tell when people intentionally lie. Where's ultra blast? Psychic clone. Ultra Blast. A character using Psionic Ultra Blast can overwhelm and damage nearby psyches. To do this, he casts Thought Waves in all directions, Captain. In layman's terms. I like how they go to layman's terms a lot. You know. Okay, how many fingers are we touching? In layman's terms, the Psionicist grumbles psychically for three rounds. Grumbles? Then his consciousness bursts forth, and a horrid psychic scream penetrates all minds within 50 feet. It's like Mariah Carey. It's, victims may never be the same again. All victims within 50 feet of the psionic ultra blast must save versus paralyzation. Failure means they pass out for 2d6 turns. Those who pass out must immediately save versus paralyzation again. If they fail a second time, they lose all psionic power. Only psychic surgery can help them recover this loss. Although the blast does not affect the initiator, the risks are great. If the power check fails, you have to you have to do a check to see if you can invoke your own power. The uh, the caster becomes comatose for one d10 days. Some characters may think he's dead. Well. The characters he tried to Ultra Blast will definitely think he's dead because they're going to stab him a million times and make sure of it. Uh, what? Metasionic meta devotions. Cannibalize. I looked through this once and I didn't see these. The power allows the character to cannibalize his own body. Auto cannibalism? You can cannibalize your own body for extra psychic points. When it's used, the character can take any number of constitution points and convert them directly to PSPs at a ratio of 1 to 8. The constitution reduction is not permanent, but it is debilitating and long-lasting. Holy shit! You can only recover one cannibalized point of constitution per week of complete rest. Ugh. Intensify. Figure that one out. Psionic inflation. What are we inflating? Usually I need to get a pump. I mean, uh, someone would need to get a, one of those. Yeah, I wouldn't know. I, I wouldn't know what those do. I've heard things. I know a guy who, who got it. Um, 
prolong. I've never had that problem, you know, with, um, I've never had to use the prolong discipline. I tantric, you know, we, we, we do it to the, we, we put on a, a, a CD and it's to the rhythm of the ocean waves. I don't know. She likes it. it, it I'm, I'm getting to the point where I can hold out for like a week. It's like sting. Uh, anyway, I, I've never needed it. Uh, uh, so yeah, we're, we're inflating and we're prolonging retrospection. I can do that all the time. Splice. Stasis. Oh, this is where we're getting into the... Okay. So, when you're looking through this, some of the titles are really cool. So, I think this is why people like to try psionics, is because you've got shit in here inflating and prolonging and, and stuff like that that you've got to know, right? Uh, one of my favorites is um, Detonate. Let me see if I can find Detonate, because that's that's a fun one. Um, well, I'll just, uh, I'll sum up for you. Uh, detonate is essentially the power to explode heads. That's the power you want. Although it is somewhat limited. Um, detonate only really affects the undead, but it's like, it's like guaranteed, you know? So the only reason they, they called it that was because I, I guess exploding heads wasn't really like, it's a little too direct, you know? Like, we don't want to really, I mean, come on. We, we got to have some decorum here. We don't just want to have a power called explode heads. Although, yes, you do. So if you read through here and you, where is it? Figures. One time I don't do it. Or you could choose daydream. You know, one or the other. If, I, if I'm flipping through this book, oh, what, what, what powers do I want? Um, let me see. Um, time shift, dream travel, astral projection. Uh, oh, daydream. Wow. Summon planar creature. And by the way, you can choose any of these. Any one. As long as you have the, the PSPs to cast it, or, or use it, it's all good. Okay, yeah, detonate. Some psionicists can make a bush self-destruct or cause a zombie to explode. <laughs> There's even a picture, and I'm not going to show it to you yet. With the detonate power, latent energy inside plants or inanimate objects can be harnessed, focused, and released explosively. The power even works against animated undead, parentheses, skeletons and zombies. It does not affect non-corporeal undead such as ghosts because they aren't material. Furthermore, the science has no effect on animals of any sort, including intelligent creatures such as humans or undead with free will. That makes no sense. So, you, you make zombies explode. You just do. Like, it gives a certain amount of damage, but if you're fighting zombies, no. Like, every zombie in front of you just explodes in a shower of gore. Like, I want to be a psionicist now. And so, like, if as soon as the DM starts describing the thriller coming at me, like, I would get so hard. Like, this is my time. This is what my character has been building up to his entire life. This is why I mastered the psionic arts. And... Like, you'd be doing trick shots. You know, like like a fireworks show. You know. You'd just be like, please send me to Ravenloft. I, I, I've been bad. Send me to Ravenloft, where the undead are plentiful. And I will just create a, a shower of death, which would make you real popular amongst the group, right? Having zombie shit rain down on you like a, like a fine pink mist. Yeah, thanks for that, pal. My clothes will never be the same. 
Or you can make bushes burst into flame. You know, one or the other. So it's like the Gambit ability. You can touch things and make them explode. Um, so, why do... When I say everyone hated this, I mean everybody. I already described why the DM hates it. But then there's the players. So you'd think... Oh, okay, here's the best power. Death Field. Death Field. It's exactly what it sounds like. For once, it is accurate in its description. A Death Field is a life-sapping region of negative energy. Only psionicists of evil alignment can learn this power without suffering side effects. If any other psionicist tries to learn the Death Field, his alignment will gradually be twisted towards evil as he explores this very dark portion of his psyche. But that's not to say he can't learn it. It's only he's going to use it in very, very dire situations. All the time. A successful death field takes its toll on everyone inside it, including the psionicist. Before he initiates the power, he must decide how many hit points he will sacrifice. Every living thing within the death field must make a saving throw versus death. Those who succeed escape damage. Those who fail lose the same number of hit points as the psionicist. For the weak, that can mean death in the death field. The pionicist loses only half the number of hit points he specifies if he makes the saving throw, you know, the pionicist. But yeah, it, apparently in the death field, that can mean death. Okay, so this is why players don't like them. Because you can start with the death field. You can start with explode zombies. You can start with danger. No, you, you can do all these things. I haven't even gotten to the really... You can ultra blast, if that's the one you picked. You can dimension door. In fact... You can Dimension Door better than a wizard ever could. And Dimension Door is like a 5th, 6th level spell. D I'm sorry, like a, you, you can go to the Astral Plane, or you can teleport. You can just do it. Like, immediately. Like, your selection is a little bit limited, and sure, it may be dangerous, but you can. And when they cross into the Astral Plane, they do it better than a wizard because... Oh, jeez, I'm getting deep into the lore here. When a wizard crosses into the astral plane, which is this nebulous area of vague energy, which connects basically to all the other planes of existence, they are tethered to the prime material plane, a.k.a. here, Earth, with what's called a silver cord. Essentially, the silver cord is what, what connects your soul, which is what is projected into the astral plane, to your corporeal body. Okay? So, or it's like, you can think of it as your way home. You know, your emergency, the emergency yank back to the real world when things get rough. But that also means the silver cord can be cut. Psionicists do not have a, a silver cord. So they, they not only can they teleport immediately, can they, can they go to the astral plane immediately, for whatever reason they want to, they don't suffer the prime weakness that even powerful wizards do. Great. Thanks. Okay. So, but here's... You might think, well, the players should be happy because the scientists can do really insanely powerful things right away, so we're always going to win. Yeah? No. So, like, yes, the, the, the psionicist could unleash the death field, could use the, the, the ultra blast, and kind of solve all your problems right away. But here's the problem. If you're a wizard, if you're a cleric, you've got a role. AD&D was not a balanced game. Never was. I never claimed it was. It's a, it's a deeply flawed game, but I love it because it's not meant to be balanced. I've, I've gone over this a little bit, but it's meant to be 
a team effort. So, no, the wizard is not balanced at first level like a fighter. A fighter is way better, because a wizard starts out with four hit points max, maybe five or six if they have an insanely high constitution. Four points. One spell. Two, if they've got, uh, uh, if they're a specialist. One. Okay? Whereas a fighter can fucking crump people for 1d12 damage with his fucking two-handed sword. That's not fair. Here's why it is. Because a wizard starts off weak because he's just learning. So... As time goes on, he gets more and more powerful until he becomes really, really dangerous. He can start throwing fireballs. He can throw those massively destructive spells. So if the wizard's here and the fighter's here, they kind of cross, like as level goes up. So the fighter always stays good at fighting, but his, his applicability, so to speak, in combat goes down. Because he can only hit so many things with a sword per round. He can only do... So... He he has kind of one answer to things, is he fights. Whereas a wizard has a, a whole arsenal of spells, can do really, really powerful things, and affects... It, it's magic. You can start doing those things that really powerful wizards do. They have much more of an influence on the field of combat. Clerics have a very pivotal role. Thieves, nobody can do what a thief does. Nobody can do what a ranger does. And most importantly, nobody can do what a cleric does. Is Which is heal, turn undead, and that... So here comes this psionicist, this asshole. Here this guy comes, and he can do anything. Oh, I can, yeah, you want me to teleport into the palace? I can do that. What, you can't? What, you've got to read a book? How long you got to read that book for? Four hours? Holy shit! How many spells you got? One? Whoa, oh, oh, you're hurt? Don't worry. I've got molecular manipulation. Or, or, they've got several heal powers. You know, I've got lend health. I've got lend strength. Um... Selecu uh, cellular realignment or something like that. Uh, uh, biofeedback. You know, they can do this thing where they psionically make your cells and flesh knit together. Who is this jerk? Now, it's like when you're on a film set. They always say, never do someone else's job for them. You have to ask permission. So, you know, a grip has a very specific job. You... A grip's job is to grip things, and and you know they're they're a pivotal part of the crew. They you know they they build things, they repair things, they carry things to and fro. They they they're technical people. So it's actually a very big faux pas if an actor starts cleaning up or starts doing grip things, because all of a sudden you're crossing over into their turf. You're doing their shit, and you're doing it wrong. Okay? So, it may not seem like a big deal, but it is. If some motherfucker came in and started doing your job, and doing it just, just un, you know, uh, 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 uncalled for, you're like, oh, well, he's saving me the work. No, you're not. You're like, this guy is trying to, to muscle me out. That's what this guy does. And not only that, he's so frigging smug about it. You know? Like, oh, I can heal, no problem. I can, I can, those zombies, oh, turn undead? I can do that way easier. Boo, 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 boo. See, they're gone. They're not just turned, they're gone. Come on, man. He can fight. There's things where they can turn their, they can turn their uh, arms and body parts into weaponry. They can, they have this thing called graft weaponry, where they can't, they, they can essentially graft a fucking sword to their arm. Right? So, they, they're they just... You hate them. And then they're bogging down combat, because now they're bring, now you're bringing intellect devourers who are actively devouring our intellects. We can't deal with this shit. We're not psionicists. 
I lost two characters already, you know. <laughs> so that finally leads me way back around to my ill-fated character whose career never got started. Literally. Because there's one other thing in the Psionics Handbook that is described where when you start out in this first edition D&D, you have to roll to see if you even qualify to be Psionic. Okay? So you had to roll an absurdly high chance to even see if you could get powers. All right? If you did, then you were a Psionicist. Here, you can choose to be a Psionicist. It's a class. Okay? You have to qualify for it with, like, attributes, you know, but you don't have to roll this absurdly strange calculation percentage. But you still can here through what's called wild talents. Okay? So, a wild talent is something that anybody can do. All right? So, any character can choose, if they wish, to test if they get a wild talent. Which, again, is one of those... It's, it's basically the same absurdly complicated role. But, you know, you've really got maybe a 4, 3, 4% chance of ever doing it. And you have to have really high stats. I, I think, like, the base chance is 1%. If you've got really high stats, um, then it modifies it by 1 or 2 points. If you manage to succeed, you have a wild talent. Um, from there, you... I believe you choose randomly... Hang on. I did bookmark this one. Yeah, regardless of class, alignment, or race, you can have a wild talent. They never approach psionicists in skill, but they do boast at least one psionic power, at least one, which is known as the wild power among psionicists. Any character can test. Um, once you've determined their chance, subtract two if the character is under the guidance of a psychic surgeon. Uh. Okay, then... You um, you have to roll to see what power you have. So among all the powers, you roll percentage. So first you have to you have to roll to see what devotion you go to. You know, telepathic, clairsentient, psychoportive, telepathic, and then you roll what percentage, what what random ability that you get. So yeah, your Random wild talent could be anything from uh, absorb disease. Yeah, you can do that. I'm going to absorb disease. You can get anything from probe or... Oh, oh, I forgot this. I even wrote it down and I forgot it. Here are my favorites. See sound. Hear light. Feel light. And that's not I feel light. I, I There's light and I feel it. What the fuck does that mean? I'll tell you. Because this gets awesome. It does not get awesome. Let's see. Feel light. Okay. Feel light. This extrasensory power allows the soundist to experience light through tactile sensations, by touch, in layman's terms. His entire body becomes a receiver for light waves. In essence, his body replaces his eyes. He can see what his eyes would normally reveal. His field of vision does not change. What? Then what? Why? What's the point? If, if your entire body becomes a light receptor, then you should be able to see out your ass. Wouldn't you think? I would want to see light, feel light through my dick. If that's the only part of me that's exposed to, the, to, to air, like if I'm completely bound in, for instance, a gimp suit, which would never happen to me, and if I was stuck in the gimp suit with my dick out and I... I couldn't get out and I desperately needed to get a phone to dial April to get me out. Then I would want to, um, maybe if it was behind me, I, I, 
feel sound. It's almost identical to feeling light, but you feel sound. The power does not detect sound where there is none. Wow. Thanks for outlining that one. It allows you to continue hearing when your ears are disabled. That's it. That's it. So, basically, you make this absurdly complicated roll, and then you roll Feel Sound. Yeah. Meanwhile, your, your friend over there also, against all odds, managed to roll a psychic, managed to roll a wild talent. He got Death Field. He got. But uh, he got uh, uh, time shift. He can travel through time. You got feel sound. You got you got empathy. Ugh. Invisibility, daydream. Oh, you got daydream. Good. That's nice. Not only that, you can get multiple wild talents on this table if you if you roll um, you can roll multiple multiple wild talents. So let me see how many you can get. Okay, yeah. So there's there's results like choose any science and two devotions. Roll three times. You know. Roll two sciences and four devotions. You can get a character who basically, for free, who doesn't have to be a psionicist, gets an entire arsenal of psionic powers. And not only do you roll for the powers, you roll randomly for the sh your strength. Okay? So, so you can have a wild talent that has virtually no points. Or... You can roll for you can roll a guy who has an absurd number of power points, who has who has a wild talent, but is amazing at it, or has several wild talents and is amazing in all of them, which can happen, unlikely but possible. So, in essence, they're mutants from the X Men. Think about it. You've got through essentially like random chance their psychic discipline or their X gene is expressed and they gain powers and they gain very specific powers that like in, in most cases one it's like telepathy like professor X weapon graft like Wolverine bub um uh, telekinesis like Jean Grey, Jean Grey you know or or like comprehend languages like cipher poor guy or you could feel light like fucking dazzler even dazzler had some had had was could harness the light offensively she didn't just feel it uh so yeah they're x men they they're mutants and believe it or not i think there was even which mutant had a death field i'm pretty sure there was one I don't know, but I'm pretty sure there was one. So, all of a sudden, you've got fucking mutants running around. Which leads me to my character. Finally. This character that I played never had a name. Because he died. And he died in character creation. Why? Well, when you roll for a wild talent, you win... Or you die. Well, or you just don't have a wild talent. So, your odds of getting a wild talent are absurdly low. You know this. But, you also have the odds of something bad happening. So, if you choose to test to see if you have a wild talent, you expose yourself potentially to harm. Only if you choose to. Not everyone... You have to sit down in your room, and willingly... You, you ever... Everyone's tried this. As stupid as it... As stupid and as unlikely 
is impossible as it is. Every single person here has tried to move something with the force. You know you have. You've just been like, I didn't think so. And you're trying it now, and it's not working. I hope it does work, though, because, man, you'll make a fortune. Um, so, yeah, essentially, your character sits down and tries to use the force. And in 1% of cases, it works. But if you roll 97 or higher, the character suffers the following consequences. 97. Save versus death or your wisdom is reduced by 1d6 points, from 1 to 6 points permanently. 98. Save versus death, or intelligence reduced by 1d6 points permanently. 99. Save versus death, or constitution reduced by 1d6 points. Or 100, if you roll 100. Save versus death with minus 5 penalty, or wisdom, intelligence, and constitution are all reduced to three permanently. I rolled 99. My character's constitution was five. I rolled a six. When your constitution goes to zero, you're dead. If your intelligence goes to zero, you are essentially a drooling fool. And you are forever incapable of anything resolve, uh, re resembling uh, uh, intelligence, uh, uh, initiative. You, you are just forever. Uh, much like wisdom, except with wisdom, if your wisdom is zero, you become a shrieking maniac. Uh, it, literally everything... It's like being bombarded with sensory information. Everything is too much for you. You go crazy. You are constantly screaming in terror at everything that is happening around you. So you're, you you become a lunatic. That's what uh, zero wisdom is. But no, my wisdom was low, or my constitution was low, and I rolled a six. My constitution had then become minus one. I was dead. That's the end of him. He died in character creation. And as far as I know, that is literally the only way to die in character creation in advanced Dungeons and Dragons. That's basically the end of the story. But um, th there, there are some footnotes to this. Psionics do have a place in D&D, &D. and that would be in the Dark Sun uh, uh, campaign setting, where not only do psionicists exist, but uh, every single character in the game has a wild talent. Everybody. So it makes more sense here because it's not something that only one person does. It is integral to the game, and it's, it's, it's kind of balanced... To, to be fair, you know, it's an even playing field, so to speak. You still have the problem where wild talents can result in absurdly powerful guys with many powers. Um, uh, but at least you're not having one person bog combat down by, you know, running 10 rounds or, or unbalancing things over much. So it does happen here. The second footnote is that probably the most infamous... It is possible to die in character creation in another RPG. There's a few others now. Hackmaster, you could do it. They kind of added that. But um, the most infamous one is the game Traveler, which is essentially, a, it's, it's a, in, in my opinion, a pretty generic sci-fi game. Um, you know, spa spacefaring, stuff like that. But you can die in character creation. Um, I've only played it one time and I never came close to dying, but apparently I'm not sure how easy it is, but people often boast, strangely enough, about how they died rolling a character in Traveler. And the way it happens is I, I believe most characters serve uh, military tours of duty. Um, and 
no matter what branch of the the military or government they serve, wherever they wherever they've done, you roll your background. You know what your character did before you started playing him or her. Um, so it it kind of outlines what your skills are. You know, it outlines your background, what you know, what you can role play as your history, and it also outlines the consequences, positive and negative, as a result of those. So let's say you were, you know, you were you received special, you know, Navy SEAL training. You would get obviously a bonus to certain skills. You would get better in combat. But there's also the opportunity to suffer lasting injuries, like maybe your character was wounded in training or in combat that occurred before you officially started the game, you know? If you accumulate enough injuries, you can die. Which is strange. Uh, in, in fact, kind of unheard of, for the most part. Like I said, I cannot recall any other game except Traveler at the time where dying in character creation was even possible. And that includes Call of Cthulhu, where if any game... You would you would be either driven insane or killed in character creation. I would think it'd be that, just because that seems fitting, right? But yeah, I think I found the only way in A D and D to die before anyone even gets around the table. Yeah, I just wonder. I wonder who he was. You know, this one day he's. He's got a bright future ahead of him, and he just, you know, the, 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 nobody, he doesn't answer his door one day, you know, and everyone knocks on the door, he doesn't answer, and the city guard comes, and they just find him. They find him slumped over his desk, and he's just bleeding from the nose. He's got the psychic nosebleed, and he's dead. He, he burst a vessel. He, try, he strained too hard. He he tried to unlock his psychic power because he read it in a book. He he tried to he tried to lift something. Tried to you know lift his dagger with a, with the force. He the strain was too much. He he burst a blood vessel and he died. But nobody will ever know. They'll just see him dead and they'll wonder why why what happened. Well, you know, and I guess. I guess that's what's important. But uh, poor guy never got a name. Like so many adventurers, he he died, well, until now, unsung, forgotten. But at least, hey, it's kind of funny. <laughs>